my name is Philip Potter. Um, I'm from the Government Digital Service. And just a little straw poll. Who's heard of Government Digital Service or GDS? That's, that's a good number. OK. So we were set up in 2011 to support the digital transformation of government. Um, uh, just at the start, I'm going to say this is a technology conference and this is a technology talk, but I'm going to start with quite a bit of background to talk about why we're doing what we're doing. So here's a history of, of GDS. We were set up in 2011. I will talk to you about what we as GDS have done in those last four years, what we learned, and what it means for what I'm now working on. So you might recognize some of what we've done, uh, maybe not all of it. So gov.uk is probably our most recognizable thing. It's the single place to find uh, information about the government. Um, but we've also, uh, so gov.uk is focused on publishing. Um, so it's about users finding information out. Um, and from a technical perspective, that's a relatively easy problem because you, know, you put some information on a website and you put a CDN in front of it and you're done. Um, uh, in terms of the content, there's a huge amount of work that's gone into it, but from a technical side, it's um, relatively simple compared to some other services that we are also working on. So when we talk about a service, we're talking about a user interacting with government. So applying for a driving license or registering to vote or um, uh, starting up a business. These are all things that involve government recognizing something or government changing something. Um, we've also worked on some other things. Gov.uk Verify is an identity platform. You'll hear a bit more about that, and I won't go through all of these. So um, the, the point is it's not just Gov.uk. It's not just publishing information that we do. We sit at the center of the civil service. We work as open, agile, multidisciplinary teams. We work with, um, we work from the center of central government, but we work with teams throughout the whole of the British government. So um, we've uh, collaborated with people in the Department for Work and Pensions and with Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs uh, to help um, build better services. And what we've learned in those last four years of doing those things is, um, especially when we were working on gov.uk, is when we're building services, um, we want to build them for users, and we want them to, build to meet user needs. In particular, a user doesn't care how government is set up. They don't care about the names of departments. They don't care who's responsible for what. They just want to get something done. So they want to know when the clocks go back or when the bank holidays are, and they don't have, want to know who's responsible for that information. And by creating gov.uk, we created a single place that people can go to for information. Um, there's still problems, though, because we can, we can create a single place for publishing. But how do we create a single place for services? There are hundreds of these services, and they're all specific to these individual bits of government. We couldn't go around each one of these and fix it. There are, there's too many. It would take ages. And there are, as I've said, there are now teams across government who are good at building individual services. Um, but there are still barriers to making them great. And one of them, I'm going to talk you through an example, is suppose I want to start a business selling food. Then I need to first create a company. And in the UK, you do that by going to company's house. Um, and you go to this page, and you've got to create a com an account with Companies House and set that up. Um, then once you've got a company, you still haven't got a full business because you need to register for taxes. So there's different kinds of taxes you can register for, but it's HMRC that you have to go to. So it's a completely different system that you have to go to and a different account. Um, and then having done that, maybe you're storing information. Maybe you've got some employees and you're storing information about them. So you need to register with the Information Commissioner's Office. And so this is another system I've got to go to. So, um, and then because I'm selling food, I've got to have a license for selling food. Um, so I've got to register here. So that's a fourth system I've had to interact with. And it's been on me to understand that structure, whereas uh, 
what we want is to start with needs. We've, got a, we've published our design principles on how we build services. Number one is this, start with needs. And to make, sure, make it very clear, this is needs of the user, not needs of the government. And so that service, um, it's definitely something that's being worked on. I'm not picking on HMRC in particular or any of those people in particular, but um, this is a common pattern where someone wants to build a service for a user. They end up having to interact with these other parts of, of the government. Um, so what can GDS do now to help, uh, to help the rest of government build these good services that meet users' needs? And the best way we can help is providing the tools, services, standards, and infrastructure that make improving every service easier. And we call this idea government as a platform. Um, we have not Emacs. Um, we've put together a two-minute demo of what that Here's a demo like. that shows the digital state in action. Let's look at a fictional new service from central government, buying a fishing license. First, you start at gov.uk, just as you would for any other government service. Then you have to confirm your identity. This demo shows a fictional identity platform, but we expect gov.uk verify to do this task. You enter your details and you're signed in. Next, the service asks for your permission to access data about you held in registers, your name, age, and any existing licenses you hold. Just those things and nothing else. You grant permission with one tap. Straight away, the service knows you're old enough for an adult fishing license because you granted permission. There are a few more details to fill in depending on what license you need. And now you have to pay for your fishing license. This is a cross-government payments platform. It looks and works the same across many different services. A few more taps and it's done. Here's your digital fishing license. You can save a copy on your phone and show it whenever you need to. Another example. This is a parking permit service from a fictional local authority. Again, you have to confirm your identity. It works just the same way as before. Now the service asks permission to see some data. In this case, it's your home address and details of cars you own. Just those things and nothing else. Straight away, the service knows which car needs the permit and where it will be parked. The fee is calculated instantly, and all this happens because you granted permission for the service to see data about you. Now you just have to pay for your permit. This is the same payments platform that we saw last time. A few more taps and it's done. Here's your copy of the parking permit. The local authority automatically knows your car is covered. There's no need to display a paper permit in the car window. <coughs> so that kind of gives a sense of the vision of government as a platform. And it's tools and building blocks that we can provide from the center to help individual government services uh, build good services that meet user needs. And within that, a critical part of it is getting the relationship with data right. Um, this is uh, becoming quite a pressing issue. The, uh, this conference has been running concurrently with the Open Data Institute Summit, which was yesterday. Um, this is the transitive closure of my boss, uh, Matt Hancock, who is the minister for the cabinet office. So he's... Um, uh, and he, was, he gave this speech yesterday, and in it he said, our core data sets must talk to each other built on high quality registers instead of lists of data replicated in each government department. So I'm gonna try and expand the rest of the talk in, uh, about what that one sentence means, basically. So this is what I'm working on. It's called registers, and it's based on this premise that bad data hinders building good services. And these are the kinds of problems that you can experience when you're building a service on top of some data. Uh, access and liveness, so can I, can I access it 
or do I have a copy of it? And if I've got a copy of it, is it, is it up to date or has it been you know, some months before I updated it? Um, quality and the cleanliness, duplication and authority, and provenance. And these are overlapping but related problems. So we are working on defining good authoritative lists you can trust. This is what we mean by registers. We call them. Um, and this is, the, this is the sort of high level view. So the box in black is a, 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 an imaginary service. And let's say it is this service to start your own business. And then at the bottom, we've got these blue boxes, each one of them is a register of data. Um, and they're uh, managed by different custodians. So the three boxes on the left are managed by one custodian, managed by organization one, and then each of the other boxes is managed by another organization. And then the service is able to take all of that and produce a single uh, thing to the user. So the user doesn't have to see this structure of government. The service can own that. So what does a good re register look like? We've started writing about this. There's a blog post that our product manager, Paul Downey, wrote um, a couple of weeks ago now, um, where we tried to list what, what good looks like. I'm not going to talk about everything he wrote about there. I'm going to pick three things, which are that they are accessible, they're authoritative, and they're trustworthy. So accessible. Um, the problem is, I, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but um, not being able to access data, working with, a, working with an old copy of a, of a data dump that you downloaded sometime and haven't updated, um, is not really good enough for, for good services. Um, we should really be uh, working against a live copy of the data, which really means programming against an API. Um, you might be surprised that, uh, that I'm even making this point, but it's, this is not a standard across government. There are a huge number of barriers to even getting access to data, if, particularly if it's one branch of government trying to get access to data that is notionally controlled by another branch of government. Um, so we've built a prototype um, to explore these ideas of what good uh, data looks like, what good sharing of data looks like. So here's a, an example entry in a register uh, for, um, a, for example, maybe a postcode. So we've got uh, postcode WC1A1AA. It's got some location data and it's got um, the identifier. Um, so you can browse it in HTML. Um, because we want to build services on top of it, you can also get access in JSON. Um, but JSON is not the, and, and in the JSON format, you can see some extra details about the serial number and a hash, and I'll talk more about those later. Um, JSON is not the only format. People use different programming languages. People consume data in different ways. So we also make the same data available in other representations, so YAML or CSV, which has the benefit that um, you can open it in a spreadsheet program, so it's good for ad hoc tasks. We also support TSV if you prefer SED and ORC for processing data. Um, we also support various uh, types of linked data. So here is um, a turtle representation. And the fact that it's linked data also is important. I'll get into that. So as well as being accessible, they're behind an API, Good registers are authoritative. This is a, a more interesting concept. So problems that you often get with access to data is that the quality of data isn't very good. There's missing columns, or there's typos, inconsistent spelling. There's just general cleanup that needs to happen. There's one data set I looked at recently where they had 12 different spellings of Scotland. <laughs> So, you know, you had Scotland and Scotland, comma, UK and Scotland, comma, United Kingdom and then Scotland or Scotlandad or, and, um, so, and, and this is not an unusual occurrence. Um, 
Another problem that you see is the same kinds of data available from different sources. And what's the problem here is, well, how do you know who to trust? What if they're different? What if they disagree with each other? Um, how do we maintain consistency? So when we say they should be authoritative, what we mean is a register should be a single source of truth. Um, and a register should have a custodian. There should be someone who's responsible for looking after this data. And they are the only people responsible for looking after that data. So I'm going to go through a, an example from our prototype. This is all um, uh, data we've, we've uh, put into our register product, although it's not, um, it's not available for public consumption yet because we're still working out uh, what um, the details of things. And so this is a potential service for exploring um, premises that process uh, animal products. And um, this one, this premises is called Robin's Pie and Mash. It's got uh, an approval number, EF017. It's got an address. There's, um, we can put it on a map. Um, you can see at the bottom here, there's some food sector sections approved. That means what kinds of animal products is it allowed to process? Because there's, there's meat, there's shellfish, there's dairy, there's honey. Um, and so the section refers to the piece of legislation that corresponds to the, um, the, the, the products that it can process. If we scroll down the page, we see this page uses data from all these different registers. There's a register of premises. There's a register of animal products premises and, and so on. And what this looks like in the register itself, well, here's our animal products premises register. Um, it's just a set of key value pairs. So we've got the identity of this specific premises, which is EF017, as we saw. Um, we've got the food establishment category, so the things that it's allowed to process. Um, and then we've got this premises field, which is this long number. And that's everything in this register. So where did all the other information come from, the address and the location and all that sort of stuff? Well. That, premise, that long number in the premises is a link to another register, a premises register. So a premises is essentially a, an address used by a business for, for, uh, for performing things. And there are many types of premises. And it's an important thing to understand for the government because businesses have to pay business rates based on premises. Um, and so it's quite conceivable that whoever is managing this animal origin products data set is not the same group that's responsible for managing this which business premises exist. And then they might not be the same group as which addresses exist. So once again, the, the premises register links has a, an address field which links through to an address register. And this is where we get into um, uh, street, address, and all that sort of stuff. So we've got three different registers managed by three different custodians, all, got to, all behind a common API, and it can all be put together to create a single service for the user. And you can also start to see the, the data linking. So if we go back to this original diagram, there are arrows from the service to each register, but there are also arrows between registers um, so, uh, so that each custodian is only storing the data that they are responsible for. The problem you often find is where a custodian is storing da data like addresses, addresses are very commonly uh, full of spelling mistakes, typos, inconsistencies. And the reason is that that's not their core business. It's not understanding addresses, it's understanding animal products processing or understanding business rates. And so by separating these out into single sources of truth whose responsibility is understanding that single piece of data and where uh, um, and delegating to responsibility to other people for uh, this peripheral thing, we can increase the quality of the data available. Um, there's a great talk by Michael Nygaard called Architecture Without an End State. Has anyone seen this talk? 
it's a, it's a good talk. And what he talks about here is this idea of dependency of entities in, in an architectural sense. And on the left, you've got things that are very common, that lots of things link to. And on the right, you've got things that are very specific. Um, and so on the right you, is where you start to add context. So this is an address which is used by a business that processes animal products. So each register is adding more data, more detail into what it does. So registers are accessible, they're authoritative, they're also trustworthy. So here's another problem. I downloaded some data. Um, where did I get it from again? Has anyone tampered with it since? Um, is this truly um, information from the register? Or uh, has, has someone come along and messed with it? So a register should be trustworthy, and we should be able to issue trustworthy information from it. A register should have guaranteed integrity. Um, and just a couple of weeks ago, I wrote in detail about this, about how we can use cryptography to guarantee the integrity of a register. There's a link at the bottom, but I'm going to take you through the principles. So here's an example. We've got a register of food inspections. So we've got a number of um, food establishments, and people go around and inspect them and give them a rating out of five stars. So we've got a number of entries in this register. Bridge Street Cafe got four stars on the 20th of February, 2014. Prima Donna got two stars on the 15th of April, 2014, and so on. And the whole, uh, each one of these entries together combined gives you the whole register. And we want to be able to give, guarantee the integrity of the whole register. So what we do is we compute a hash of each of the entries, which are these letters here, and then we combine them into a Merkle tree. So a Merkle tree is a tree where each letter, uh, each node is labeled with the hash of the labels of the nodes below. So you can see here, we've got A and B. We, take, we just concatenate A and B together and compute the hash and we get G. And we've got G and H and we concatenate them together and we compute the hash and we get K. And, and so on until we get to the top. We get a root hash which is called M and we take that and we sign it. And it's called signature five here because um, there are five entries in the register. And, um, and so now I can download a whole copy of the data set and I can use this signature to verify that I've got the right data in the right order. But I can go further than that. I mean, let's say Roy's roles here want to uh, display on their premises um, that, they're, that they've got a three-star rating, and they want to have a guarantee that this really is what's in the register. What they can do is they can offer a proof. Um, so a record in a register should have a digital proof of authenticity. And this is from the video that this was a fishing rod license, but we're talking about what might be in this barcode or this, um, or this hex string. Um, it could be an identity number, or it could be a signature of that record right there. And so this proof can be done with this Merkle tree. So what I need to know in order to guarantee that Roy's roles is in this tree is, well, I, I've got the entry, because you gave it to me, and I can compute its hash, um, but I can't compute M unless you also tell me what K is. But if you tell me K, and I combine it with E and hash it to get M, I can have confidence that, this, uh, the, that Roy's rolls really came from that subtree, because you couldn't have come up with another value to give a different value M, because that's the property of hash functions. Um, and then I can verify that the signature um, uh, validly signs M, and having checked all that out, I now know, OK, this really is an entry from the register. And in particular, I haven't had to download the entire register to check the proof 
that a single entry is in there. So I, I have a nice way of taking extracts from a register and demonstrating the authenticity of them. And I can download that proof and keep it and check it again later. There's all sorts of good properties that gives, this gives, which I will get into. Another thing is a, a register should keep its word. So once we've issued a rating, we shouldn't be able to rewrite history. We shouldn't be able to have some malicious actor go in and remove a bad rating for a restaurant or remove a good rating, say. Um, and so how can we prove, how can we add data to a register and prove that we haven't removed or changed any history? So here we've got our original register. And then prima donna is reinspected. So we add a new element to the end. And now we compute a new Merkle tree using the same rule as before. So we've combined E and F to get, and hash it to get I. We combine K and I and hash it to get N. And only the green parts have changed. Everything else has stayed the same. So we've been able to reuse this whole subtree below K. Um, and we compute a new <coughs> signature. But at first sight, this looks like it has nothing to do with the previous one because it's a different route, it's a different signature. How do I know that history has been preserved? Well, I can prove it to you with what's called a consistency proof. If I can show that the, um, the whole five entries in the, uh, the tree of length five is the same as the first five entries in the tree of length six, then I can show that I haven't rewritten history. And the way I do that is, well, all I need to show you is, um, well, K, I give you K and E and F and tell you where they are in the tree. And then you can compute for yourself that, oh, yes, K and E combine to give you M, which matches the original signature. And K, E, and F combined in this way give, combine to give N, which uh, give you the new signature. And I can see that K and E form a prefix of the, the tree of length six, which means, yes, history has been preserved. So we have, the, the, we have the two kinds of proof here. We have the, uh, the proof of an entry being an extract from a register, and we have the proof of history being preserved and that a register is truly an append-only data store. Um, given it's an append-only data store, there is then the question of how do we track changes? Because the real world does change. Um, and so if we go back to this... Uh, product of animal origin example. Let's say that we get an, um, uh, Robin's pie and mash expands to also process eels, um, which means it wants to uh, add another section to this food establishment categories. Can everyone read this, by the way? Yeah, good. Um, so we can, take, um, we can take this entry, change one of the elements, and add a new entry. And you can see how we've added an extra section here. The other two haven't. But also that this hash has changed. And because that represents the hash of the, whole, of the contents. And we can also look at the history. And we can say, well, entry 3416 from the register was the first version of EF017. And entry 5. 817 was the second version of EF017. And we can join these together because they have the same uh, identifier here. So we, this is sort of like a primary key, except rather than um, being a unique constraint, this primary key is a thing that identifies a history throughout the whole register. And I don't know if any of you came to uh, my colleague Kush's talk yesterday, which was about schedulers. He said, one of his refrains was, I see schedulers everywhere. Well, I see registers everywhere. <laughs> because I don't know how many of you have been, been playing the giant operation in the, uh, uh, in the lobby out there. You can see we've got um, a wall of fame of people and the time they took to complete the operation. So we've got Michael took 53 seconds and Javier took 56 and so on. I did quite well, I got 52. And then Javier came along later and got 41. So this is our append-only list. And we don't remove Javier's previous uh, thing. We 
append to the end, and so we can see his improvement over time. Of course, it didn't quite work out like this, because I looked at it again today, and we've gone back to bad old mutable state. <laughs> um, but, but we can see how we... Sorry? We are, we are also lacking hashes. It's a very good point. So if we put it all together, what does this look like to build? So um, data comes into the system somehow. Um, we're imagining a propose API. So I propose to set up a new company. I propose to uh, um, book a driving license. And then this is a wonderful bubble to put on any slide, which is a, a cloud that says domain-specific processing. Um, but this, uh, this is because we're, we're trying to solve the general problem of data, but each one of these custodians will have a different way of maintaining updates to that. And, um, and they could be as simple as um, uh, somebody applies for something and you just issue, you, you do some checks and you issue the license, or it could be as complex as, let's say we have a register of what food establishment categories exist. Well, the way you change that register is you change the law. So inside this bubble is the House of Commons. Um, thankfully, that, that bit is uh, out of scope for this talk. Um, but then after that, we decide on certain things we want to append into the register through a Mint API. So we call the process of adding data to the register minting it. And as we do that, we also hash it and compute a new Merkle tree. And we've got this append-only data store. And this is aggressively normalized and also aggressively not at all indexed. You can read through it in serial order, and that's it. Um, so then you want to be able to actually run queries on the data. So you want to see, OK, tell me the detail about premises EF017. So we have a key lookup index. And this is index is created by scanning through the append-only data store and then streaming updates from it. And it can store, OK, what's the latest version for each of the, en uh, the entries in my um, register? And then in front of this, we can put a read API. And uh, services can then consume off of that API to consume the data. Um, there's actually. So this is a complete system. This is a thing that could, could be built, could work. But there's actually one extra thing you could do here, which I think is quite exciting, which is because we've got those proofs of um, the validity of extracts from the register, you could have a third party index the register. So they could download the whole register, index it, and maybe stream updates and keep their index up to date. And then a service could consume that index. Um, the reason this is exciting is because in a lot of cases, indexing is hard and domain specific. You know, full text search depends on the kind of text that you're indexing over. Um, geo search can be, um, uh, depend on the kind of boundaries you're dealing with. And so you can build a third party index that when you run your search queries out of it, um, it gives you results, which are entries which have proofs that they came from the original register. So you can have, you can, despite the fact that this third party might not be that trusted, relatively speaking, it can give you entries that are trusted. Um, and one of the things, and this is because we've uh, baked proofs of integrity into the data itself. We've not just tacked it onto the transport layer through the use of HTTPS, you know, um, HTTPS is, uh, just guards a single um, link, whereas uh, um, these Merkle trees guard the data itself, no matter how many hands it passes through. So that's as far as we've got, really. Um, talk about where we're going from here. We don't have all the answers yet. Um, some of these things... Uh, so we don't know what those third-party indexes will look like. We don't know a huge amount about this domain-specific processing. Um, we, we're still not sure the details of all these APIs. That's okay. We're only just beginning to ask the right questions on this stuff. And there are definitely still unresolved issues. Um, but we think there's definitely an idea here 
about registers, which are authoritative lists you can trust. So here are the references for links in the talk. Um, thank you very much. Do we have any questions? I'm just curious real quick about implementation details, the data store, the index. Um, yes. Yeah, so, uh, so we're building this um, at the moment on Postgres. Um, partly because Postgres supports JSON, um, and so we can, uh, we can do JSON queries and the data that we are storing is in JSON. Um, we're going to change some of that. Uh, we're exploring, so this append-only data store here, right now, it, it, it's, um, as, I, as I say, this is Postgres, and this key lookup look index is also Postgres. We're exploring using, um, Google's certificate transparency product um, because, uh, I mean, in fact, the whole thing about Merkle trees is straight out of Google's certificate transparency project. Um, in their situation, what they're dealing with is an append-only log of uh, X509 certificates. Here, what we're interested in is an append-only log of, as it happens, JSON data. Um, but either way, it's uh, the... Uh, if we don't have to rebuild a cryptographic primitive, we don't want to. So we're exploring uh, using that product instead. Any other questions? So I see how the uh, Merkle tree will help you prove that a certain record exists in the register. Is there also some way you can prove that a version of the record is the latest, i.e. prove the absence of subsequent versions of that same like primary key thing? So yes, that, that's a really interesting question and it's a much harder problem because um, if you prove that a, uh, if you prove that an entry is, exists in a register, well that's, that's a thing that never stops being true. But if you want to prove that a, an entry is the latest for a thing <coughs> in a register, well that's a thing that might stop being true at some point in the future. And so um, whatever proofs that you have, there needs to be some sense of expiry, there needs to be, or there needs to be some way of going back to the source of truth where you have to go and ask the original register, is this still up to date? Um, there's some work, again, from the certificate transparency team around verifiable maps. Um, there's also a team um, uh, at, um, I can't remember where they are, I think it might be University of Illinois, uh, building, uh, working on a thing called the update framework, which is um, actually in the domain of software updates. Because in software updates, it's very important that you have not just a valid signed up uh, software update, but the most up-to-date one that's got all the security patches in it. Um, so there's, there's definitely research in this area. We're focusing <coughs> up for the moment on validating the entries, but we want to get somewhere where we're, we're exploring getting even stronger guarantees in the future. Um, I'm just curious about the uh, around the, the field level permission and such. We've got a big JSON blog right now. Um, it, it makes its way out. You've got different departments. They want to, they want to expose a subset of their data rather than the whole blog. Is, is that a consideration, you know, being able to, to have access control specifically on specific subsets of that JSON blog? Have a department be able to control who gets access to different parts of it. So yeah, for this talk, I limited it to open data just because that's easiest to talk about. But we're definitely exploring the idea of of registers that are not openly accessible to the world that contain, contain say, personal information or contain information that there's administrative fees to access or um, similar things like that. Um, I think an interesting idea there is where access is different, maybe it's a different register, and the register as a whole is either open or closed, or private, or however, we, but... Um, so you have different views of the same data in different registers? Well, you would, you would link, so the, um, the private data might link to the open data to enrich it with more private information. But as I say, the, this is all very speculative at the moment. Um, 
uh, as I say, we've been focusing on the open stuff for the moment. 